As we begin this Sunday morning, we first of all, we do want to thank each and every one for coming out to One Accord Church. We're glad to have you here today. For those of you that are viewing us live, um, you're welcome to go on our website, which is oneaccordchurch.net. We'd love for you to come join us there. You can catch all our services Wednesday nights and Sundays. So we invite you to go to oneaccordchurch.net to catch all our services. And also for those that are viewing us live and all our television programs, we want to just thank you as well for tuning in to our services and want to take the opportunity to invite you to come join us at One Accord Church. You know, I know that the world is going through a tough time, but One Accord Church, we stand on the Word. We believe it from front to back. We stand on the promises of God's Word. And today in time, we need more than ever churches that really truly believe in this. And if you believe in that, we'd like to invite you to come join us at One Accord Church. And let's make an impact on this world before Jesus comes. Amen. Well, you know, um, this message is a, actually it goes back to Isaiah's time. And as I was doing this message, I thought about, what God must be thinking? <laughs> That's a loaded question, isn't it? Let's just be honest. What God is thinking? Well, look, the message entitled this morning, is, What Makes God Wonder? Now, you might be thinking of many things that, that, that make us wonder, like we behold the seven wonders of the world, and I even looked them up because I really didn't know for sure what they were. But I was amazed at these things that people, the seven wonders of the world. We wonder at sights and sounds that go beyond our understanding. How many of us ever watch the shows where people get up that nobody has ever heard for, and then they go to singing it just like people's jaws drop because they were so shocked at what, how God has used them. There's a lot of things that make us wonder beyond our understandings. Uh, and also, we wonder at a newborn birth or, or um, uh, storms and how powerful they can be and the damage they can be and volcanoes erupting and earthquakes. There's so many wonders out there that just really just shock us. But Isaiah 59, 16, I want to just read that one verse of Scripture. And we will be in Isaiah 59 through this service, but I want you to listen to just one verse of Scripture to begin with. And in Isaiah 59, 16 said, And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness is sustained him. It sustained him. Now, that made God wonder, where was everybody at? God's got to be wondering. Y'all, let's be honest. God's got to be going, what's going on here? But let me tell you also how that Psalms 77, um, verse 11 through 14, 14, we wonder at the great works of God. Now, before I go to the bad, I want to go to the good. I kind of want you to understand what the psalmist David was saying when we're talking about what makes God wonder. Well, listen to what David said. David said, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy works and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? That's a question, people. Who is so great as God as ours? There's none. God is great. In verse 14, he said, Thou art the God that doest what? Wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Y'all never really hear about that, do you? The strength among the people. And listen, God has declared to the children of Israel in the book of Isaiah and Psalms, He has declared who He is. We behold the wonders of God's great creation. We behold the wonders of God's great love. The incarnation, the cross, the resurrection, all this is great. We behold the great wonders of fulfilled prophecy. Where 
for question like um, Christ with a prophesied Christ's return. Ain't you glad? Ain't you glad he came when God said it was time? Ain't you glad he's coming again when God says it's time? But now I want to get to the bad stuff. The question of it is, is what makes God wonder? Now I told you we're going to be in the book of Isaiah. Now I want to begin in Isaiah 59. I would like for you to follow along with me. Stay awake if all possible. And listen because let me tell you what we don't like to hear. Stuff that doesn't fit with what we want to do. So I want you to listen to Isaiah beginning in verse 2. This is some strong scripture. But I believe that God is trying to send us a message through his word. If we just be willing to share the word without compromise. That we in the pulpit and teachers and all will not compromise for the sake of of getting numbers or to make people happy. How many of you realize I don't care how mad you make me as long as you get me there? The preacher made me happy. He was all about inspiration. He was all about this, this, and this. How'd I end up here? Why well, come he didn't tell me what I was doing wrong so I could make it right so I could get where I needed to be? I think we really, the world needs to understand we're not here for God to please us. We're here to please God. Amen. When did we ever think that God was supposed to, we're supposed to be glorified? No, we're supposed to glorify God. Amen. Now, with that being said, listen to what he said in Isaiah 59 too. But your inequities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with inequity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perseverance. Excuse me, perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity. They speak lies, they conceive mischief, and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice <laughs> eggs and weave the spider's web. Now he that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into viper. Their web shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their past. They, the way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doeth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity, for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like a like blind, and we grope as we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us for our transgressions are with us and as for our iniquities we know them in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God speaking oppression and revolt conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood 
and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and iniquity cannot enter. Well, that didn't make nobody say amen, did it? Whew, you talking about taking a dose of castor oil in your Sunday morning service. That did it, didn't it? What makes God wonder? We got to be honest. Stay with me because listen, people right now are having to be worried about where they put the stuff when they leave the businesses. So for people breaking in, trying to tear up everything, people are walking in and, and, and so much violence and rage. And they listen closely. I got a revelation for you. God's watching. Let me say this to all you thugs. God's watching. God's going to get his revenge. You don't mess with God's children. You do. You pay the price. That's the word of God. I'm just saying, he said, vengeance is mine. Say after the Lord. I like that. Who's got your back? God. <laughs> Who's got your back? God. I got news for you. Satan better turn and run while he can. Amen. But we just talked about in verses 2 through 14 and, and, and how we read in Isaiah that God must wonder at the passiveness of his people over sin. Let me say that to you again. God must wonder at the passiveness of his, pe his people over sin. We need to consider the terrible moral and spiritual condition of Isaiah's time and look at us now. We need to realize something, and I, I, I want to say this biblically correct, but sometimes I don't get it right. The only problem we got in the, in the United States right now is sin. It ain't a color. It, 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 you can't put it on people. You can't put it. It's sin. Sin is what's causing all these problems. I wish we would riot against sin. I wish the church would riot against sin. I think instead of painting crooks on a poster, I think we need to put Satan up there and riot against him. Throw this fellow up there with a pitchfork and whatever y'all got him looking like and let's ride against the enemy. Uh, that probably didn't go over well. In Isaiah, God's word said it was a time of violence and dishonesty. Shock. I think we've kind of tapped over that a little bit. What do y'all think? In verse 4, it was a time of injustice and crooked dealings. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. I'm just reading what the God, word of God said. Crooked, said crooked dealings. Wow, nowadays you got to hire a lawyer just to agree on anything. You can't take nobody's word for nothing no more. I've seen the time, and I, I honestly can tell you, if somebody wanted to sell a tractor or a truck, they shook on it. If somebody wanted to borrow money, you shook on it, and you paid them back. Y'all know I'm right. Now you got to have 12 lawyers. And then they drag it out in court until everybody's broke, and then they all go home. Y'all know I'm right. Yeah, and, and this, this, is, this is what makes God wonder. Listen, God hasn't changed. God is still the same God. So can somebody just be a light bulb for me this morning. If God ain't changed, what's changed and who's changed? The church has changed. 
He said in Isaiah, we, we read earlier, it was a time when evil seemed to be triumphing over good. That's what I just read in Isaiah. It was a time when evil seemed to be triumphing over good. Guess what? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. We can't go to church. We can't get together. But get you a sign and go out there and break curfew and everybody gets together. I'm just telling you like I see it. It's not a color thing. It's a seeing thing. We all know this seems familiar. We see evil and on the rise as we speak today. Let's just be honest. Let's just go back six months. Who would have ever imagined that we'd have been in the position that we're in with sickness? Who would have ever imagined we'd ever seen the time that you shut down the state, yeah. to shut down the schools, yeah. that you shut, shut whoever? We never saw that coming. Let's just be honest. But then a after that toppled off, who would have thought that we would have went to the point of this political garbage that's making people separate themselves rather than bring them together for Christ? Listen, we're all supposed to be in one accord with Christ. Amen. We've got to quit blaming each other and blame the one that's behind it. Amen. His name is Satan. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's going to hell, and he wants to carry everybody he can with him. If we don't stop riding for the wrong reasons and start lifting up Jesus, people are going to be following him. For example, he even said in verses 5 through 8, there was confusion that reigned among the people. He said, that, he said, we roar all like bears and mourn like doves, sour like doves. What is he saying? Yeah, we get out there, we got a big bark. But when it comes time to do the job, we puny up. We, get, we back down. Listen, this is not the time to back down. This is time for the church to say, look, I'm not ashamed of being a Christian. I'm not religious. I'm a Christian. I'm a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, and I don't believe in the garbage that this world is doing. My God is in charge. My God is my president. My God is who I listen to. I'm not going to let the world tell me what to do. I'm going to let the Word of God tell me what to do. I'm not going to be passive because it's going to make somebody mad. I'm not going to get passive because my skin's a different color. I am a born-again child of God, and what flows through me and my heart is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's no color. It's called red. There's no more public outcry against sin. Oh, but give us a cause and we'll go with it. Yeah. Let me tell you what the public outcry should be. Anything and everyone that goes against God's word. Amen. Amen. For people to get up and speak their peace without it being God's word needs to shut up and sit down. The sins, y'all know Matthew Henry, right? Great writer. Matthew Henry commentaries, wrote translations of the Bible. Here's what he said. Boy, did he know what was going to happen. The sins of a nation bring public judgment when not restrained. I don't get this. I'm smiling while I'm saying it. I don't get this. We can't get people to come in God's house and worship him. But give us something in the world to go after and you can't shut us down. They told him, you know, you got a curfew. Guess what? They all broke it. They said there's a virus going around so everybody stays home. Somebody just do the math in this fluctuation. 
When it comes to evil, people don't care what you say. But when it comes to Christians, we all back down. No, no, we can't do that. You know why we can't keep backing down and be passive? It's because our children depend on us. Because if we don't stand up and take authority, drugs and alcohol and all these things that Satan is using, it's going to destroy the minds of our children. We won't be passive when it's one of our children. We ain't going to sit back and say, oh, well. He said we might not need to do this. Let me go on and tell you something. If your child's in a place he shouldn't be, you're going to go after him. Well, I recommend you don't go. Well, you take your recommendations and put them in the closet. Why are y'all laughing? That's what I meant. But as Christians... We should walk in power and authority. Let me tell you something, what that means. You are in Christ. Christ is in you. Listen, say, Satan is under your feet, not over your head. But we need to get some authority back in what we are. We need to get some power. Let me tell you what you're not going to shut up, God. You can take him out of the White House. You can take him out of the courthouse. You could take him out of the schoolhouse, but you can't take him out of the temple. You can't have nothing on your desk that resembles a cross. You can't put out nothing that resembles any scripture. Well, let me tell you what you can put out, the temple. Wherever you go, Christ goes. Somebody work with me here. You want to mess up a riot? Show up with Jesus. Why are you here? Jesus. What you got to say? Jesus. We need to understand something too. That God must wonder at the persecution of his people who stand for the truth. Let me say that to you again. God must wonder at the persecution of his people. My people's not paying me no mind. Somebody tap. Bless the heart. God must wonder at the persecution of his people who stand for the truth. Thank you. Church, Christians are being persecuted because we stand up for the truth. The truth will set you what? Free. The truth will set you what? Free, Free from what? Sin. Free from this world. Yeah. Any and everything that this world throws at us, we are free from it. We're not under the bondage of the law. We're under the bondage of the law if we put ourselves out there in it. And listen, as Christians, we have the right to speak the truth. You have the right to share the Word of God. You have the right to tell people what God says. I've noticed on social media that if you really want them to, I think they're using the term, that they'll take your stuff off. If it's offensive to the world. I got to say it. Joan's not in here. You can't fix stupid. And let me just go on and say this to you. If you want to block me for saying what God's word says, block me. But I'm going to speak it. I'm going to say it. And I'm going to tell you one thing. This is the only hope that we've got. This is the only hope that we've got to overcome and what's happening in this world. Isaiah 59, 15 wasn't up there, but I want you to listen. He said, yea, truth faileth, and he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. 
In other words, his people stood up for, they, they turned away from evil and they stood up for right. And it displeased God to watch the people not get behind them and stand up for them. Let me tell you something. When somebody is out there preaching, teaching the truth or trying to share the truth, we need to stand behind them. We need to rally up with those that's not ashamed of telling the truth. Well, I don't like to hear it. Well, get over it. Yeah. I'm not here to babysit. I'm here to show you how to get from hell to heaven. I'm, sh I'm here to show you how to get to eternity. And I'm here to show you that you can't get there living the way we're living. And this world's not going to get no better until the church gets better. The point is this, that those who stand against evil often place themselves in jeopardy. And it's sad. Who would have thought growing up that the church would be under so much persecution? That preachers are being locked up because they defile the order. Can I go here? Preachers were locked up for defiling the order, yet thousands and thousands and thousands of people that were violently protesting did not get locked up. I'm just telling you straight up. Something's wrong with this picture. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's called sin. How about, let's look at the, the prophets <coughs> and also their persecution. <clears throat> well, we can't leave out Jesus. Jesus is the prime example of one who suffered for righteousness. Jesus' pure life turned legalists of his day against him. Listen to this point. Those who claim to be righteous crucified the righteous one. People are out there using Jesus as an excuse to commit their crimes. That's not God. Wrong is wrong and right is right. Two wrongs don't make a right. And we need to understand this, that if they'll do this to Jesus, yeah. who's in everybody around here that knows Jesus? Yeah. Jesus. So who do you think Satan's after? Yeah. 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 Why are they tearing down businesses that have nothing to do with this? It's because of people's walk. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the color of the skin that's causing this violence. It's the color of our heart that's causing the violence out there. Because people don't like you. Yeah. Well, preacher, I would love to hear something inspiring. <laughs> oh, well, I'm working on it. Paul said something that helps us understand 2 Timothy 3.12. Now, I want you to listen to this scripture, guys, because this is important. This is all about, Paul said, that this is going to be a condition that's going to, we're going to go through. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Suffer persecution. So listen, the bottom line of it is, Paul says, we're going to suffer persecution. In fact, Paul told us, I'm going to throw you over to another one in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. Listen to what Paul said. He said, are they ministers of Christ? He said, I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, off. Paul was letting you know that because the more he become Christ-like, the more the world come after him. That you were going to suffer persecution. But listen, greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. So whenever we suffer persecution in this world, let me tell you something. We got something bigger. We got something more powerful. We got Jesus inside us. We got the Holy Spirit. And listen, that means that we are going to go through it. But he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The church needs to wake up and realize that we got a job to do for God. How important is one soul? <laughs> I'm going to say this to you again. How important is one soul? All right, I, I tell you what, I'll rephrase it. 
How many of us know somebody in their family that you wish they knew Jesus? How important is that soul now? Let me tell you something. There should nothing stop us from doing what we've been put here to do. And that's to share the gospel. But we must do it with love and compassion, not ball bats and hand grenades. And bricks. Thank you, I heard you. We got to get this, church. We got to get this. We're here to save souls. The reason why all this stuff is going around on us, listen, it's not for the signs of times. It's what Satan is doing to get our eyes off of what we're here to do. If he can get us mad at lost, we'll never reach the lost. If we hate people because they're lost, we'll never reach them. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Listen closely. The only difference between a sinner and a saint is sin. You remove the sin, you have a saint. Listen, the only reason violence is running wild is because the church is not reaching the lost and telling them that they can't help themselves because the father of lies is their father. They're doing exactly what they know to do. We're supposed to be children of God. God's our Father. So we should be telling them, God loves you. Father Satan wants you to burn. Jesus Christ wants to save you. Sin ain't going nowhere. But neither should, should Jesus. Let me tell you what should be packed. The churches. But we find every excuse in the world, don't we? But let it be something we believe in. We'll defy the government. We'll defy, we'll defy everybody because it's something we believe in. You know what I wish? I wish the church believed in Jesus that much. Somebody think about that a second. I just wish... We had the desire and zeal to share Christ as we do this mess in this world. What makes God wonder? At the prayerlessness of his people in sinful situations. What do I mean? We're voicing, and I've got nothing against social media. Please don't think I do. We do our ministries. We, we stream, but you can use it for the good. But what shocks me is we're getting more of the people's attitude than we are prayer. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time we prayed for this nation? I mean, really prayed. Well, this is in a mess, but let me explain something. You're in this nation. Your children are educated by this nation. Our church is in this nation. Our livelihood is in this nation. So you don't think we need to pray for this nation? We might not like the leaders, but it, don't, it doesn't matter whether you like them, you better pray for them. Because they're the ones making the decisions that's affecting your child's future. They're the ones affecting the jobs. They're the ones affecting everything around you. Are they right? No. But you pray in the name of God to, for God to intervene in their circumstances. In Isaiah 59, 16, I read that earlier. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. What's an intercessor? Somebody that does what? intercede to pray now this is kind of where I really wanted to, to, to go and I want you to listen to this so important interceding for those in desperate situations has been a mark of heroes of faith let me say that to you again interceding for those in desperate situations has been a mark of heroes of faith. Abraham, he interceded for Lot 
in those in sinful Sodom. If you know the story, he begged and pleaded with him. And what did he do? God hurt him. Moses interceded for Israel when they deserved judgment. What did he do? I know God, please, I won't explain, but there might be so many. There might be so many. There might be so many. God kept listening and God did what? He turned away from what he was going to do. Because somebody, Moses interceded for him. Moses interceded. Also, Jeremiah, he interceded with tears over the sins of his people. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah, the Bible said, he wept over the people. He, he, he wept and prayed because he didn't want God to destroy the people. This is biblical, guys. Jesus interceded for us. He interceded for those that crucified him. What's interceded? means he, he interceded for you and I. Luke 23, 34. I want you to put that up there, guys, because if this, if this don't get your attention, nothing will. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, st leave that scripture right there. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But look what happened after he prayed that prayer. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. They still didn't stop. But Jesus interceded for them. Even though they were the ones put him there and crucifying him. Did you know the early church also interceded for, for Peter? Did you know Peter was in prison? One verse of scripture, Act 12, 5. Listen closely. Peter is in prison. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But look what happened next. But prayer was made without ceasing of the what? Unto God for him. Do you know the rest of the story? The church interceded. Who are we? Interceded for Peter being in prison. Look, Peter walked out. Escorted. To freedom. Did he not? How did that happen? Because a church interceded to God on Peter's behalf. Church, we need to follow these examples. Put down your bats. Put down your attitudes. Put down whatever it is you're wearing. And lift up something called interceding the prayer. You want the government to be better? Intercede. By praying. You want to get rid of a color thing? Change the color of your heart and start interceding and praying for your enemies. We want the church to survive. We need to intercede. But if we don't intercede, God's going to wonder why. Asking you shall. We need to intercede more than ever. Let me tell you what's happened. This disease, the sickness hasn't gone nowhere. It's silently still destroying. Regardless of how they made it, who made it, and why they're doing it. Violence is not going nowhere. And if the church starts walking in fear and starts shutting their doors because they're afraid then Satan's going to win. I believe with all my heart that the gates of hell cannot prevail if we intercede right now for the church, for believers in Christ. I believe we need to intercede because there are people out there right now as we speak that are standing for the Word of God. There are teachers out there right now that believe in Jesus, that are trying to teach Jesus. There are people out there still carrying out, but we need to intercede for those that's trying to do it God's way. We need to intercede. We need to pray for church leaders. Don't fuss at your preacher. Thank God you got one. Don't fuss at Sunday school teachers. Thank God you got one. Don't fuss at your church. Thank God you got one. My question I want to ask you this morning is simple. This is a call to arms. Where are those who will speak out 
against sin. Where are they? They're not in the White House because we're too religious. They're not in the courthouse because you're not, you don't have to put your hand on the Bible to tell the truth anymore. They're trying to rob the schools of all about Jesus and prayer. Where are the people that speak up against sin? Where are they? Where are those who will stand for truth in spite of the cost? Let me tell you, I said how much important is one soul? The cost cannot be calculated. If it means my son coming to know Jesus so that he'll spend eternity in heaven, there's no price tag on a soul. There's no price tag. We need people that are willing to stand for this. Where are the intercessors we need in this time and day? I want to ask you a question. Where are we? God is wondering, where are my people? Where are the people that are willing to intercede for what Jesus did? Where he, God's looking down at the homeless, the hungry, different countries that are people that are starving to death. God is looking down at the lost souls. And he's wondering, where are my people? Where, where's the church? We're here. Jesus said, we're two or more gathering in my name. I'm in the midst. Boy, I'm going to tell you what's the truth. Satan's going to lose this battle. Because I'm not going to lose my faith. I'm not going to walk in fear. I'm going to walk in faith. And, and as they come up this morning, I want to ask you a question. How many of us are sick and tired of letting the enemy have his way when he shouldn't be having his way? Where are the people that God has chosen to carry out this purpose? Where is the army of God? Where are the intercessors? As they are up there this morning, I want to encourage you just to get off your routine of what you think you should and shouldn't do. God has been watching everything unfold in this earth. Do you agree? And God's going, when are my people going to not be ashamed? Because he says, if you're ashamed of me, he said, I'll be ashamed of you. Does anybody in this room or listening, do you want God to be ashamed of you? Somebody just think about it. God being ashamed of me. Oh, my goodness. God being ashamed of me. Looking at me and saying, I'm ashamed. No. But we have an opportunity to let God know we don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. But we can tell you what's going on here at One Accord Church this morning. We're not ashamed. We're not done. We're not ashamed. And we're going to intercede for the world. We're going to intercede for sin. We're going to intercede for the lost. We're going to intercede for all those that's on the battle line for Jesus this morning. I want to encourage you as they sing a song. Church, this altar is open. Let's intercede. Like God's word said, and, and so God will see the sincerity of our heart. This altar's open, church.